I'm Hugh Howard, the Chief Librarian here, and this afternoon we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Sonar Choptai, who many of you know. Um, Dr. Choptai is the Bear Family Fellow and Director of the Turkish Research Program at the Washington Institute. He has a PhD from Yale University. Uh, his dissertation was on Turkish nationalism. He's written extensively on, this, on the subject of Turkey, and he has lectured at uh, numerous schools. Um, he has a brand new book that just came out. In fact, it's so new we haven't gotten a copy yet. Could I hold, hold it up? It's The Rise of Turkey, the um, 21st Century's First Muslim Power. And I'm very pleased today to have Dr. Sonar Choptai. Thank you. Thank you again, Hugh, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, so pleased to see a lot of old friends around the room. Great to see you all. Um, I'm uh, delighted that this is uh, the first talk I'm doing on my uh, recently published book, The Rise of Turkey. It actually came out only less than two weeks ago. Uh, at the Washington Institute where I work, we sent out an announcement last week uh, making this public. And it just happened to be that I had set this event up anticipating the publication of the book around this time of the year, and it worked out. And I'm just especially delighted that this is my first event to discuss my book, uh, which is a culmination of a lot of my studies in the last 10 years as I looked at Turkey and studied it from different angles. And I'm very pleased to see all of you in this room for this, uh, for this chat about the rise of Turkey, question mark, not in the title, but in the narrative, which I'll come to in a minute, and as well as uh, take you through a a, uh, a tour of my book and some of its underlining uh, uh, findings as well as conclusions. I should st start by saying that uh, there are many people uh, to whom I owe thanks for this book, uh, who inspired me, who were part of the process. And uh, many of these people are actually in this room. Uh, I find out that I write better when I teach. Uh, when I teach, I get great questions. Those questions force me to think and crystallize issues in such a way that they'll be accessible to the broader public, but also for experts. I ran our program at the State Department at FSI, uh, the Turkey program, for almost a decade, and uh, have a, number of, uh, a great number of friends and colleagues from State Department. And I think it was uh, as a result of uh, that experience as well, this book came to fruition. I especially would like to recognize my friend Jen Moore, who inspired me to write this book. Uh, this is my third book. Uh, uh, in each and every one case, I found out that you basically start to write a book when someone you really love says, write a book. This is how it starts. You see, the first answer is saying no. And then it kind of says, the person says, write a book. You say, maybe they have a point. So uh, Jen was the inspiration. She helped me get to that point. And I decided to write this book some big, middle of last year, finished the first draft, submitted it. Uh, obviously, it changed significantly. A lot of people read it. Again, people in this room gave me valuable and very useful comments. Uh, finally, I'm very happy to hold it here in my hands. <clears throat> and uh, it does have a very nice picture, which I love. It shows you the, the Ortaköy Mosque on the Bosphorus. This is an iconic mosque. Uh, you know, a couple of presidents have used it as a backdrop in their speeches. You know, it's kind of the best of Istanbul because the, on this side it faces the Bosphorus Bridge, so you can have a mosque and a bridge, Europe and Asia. The image I used this time is actually my publisher, University of Nebraska, used is uh, the Ortaköy Mosque uh, with the picture taken from the side of the bridge. So you don't see the bridge, but you see Istanbul's uh, financial district, the rise of Turkey as a capitalist middle class society, uh, though with a strong Muslim identity. I think that really encapsulates uh, the theme of the book as well. So Turkey is rising. Um, <clears throat> indeed it is, and I think the economic success story is where you really look at Turkey's rise and give it a lot of credit. And uh, I, I, kept, I uh, structured the book so that I could uh, make it accessible to not only experts uh, like the, you in this room, but anyone who picks up the New York Times and follows foreign policy debates so they could connect to Turkey's rise. One of the ways I thought of doing this is I decided to do, write the book as a travelogue. So I wrote uh, chapters, and each chapter written from a different city, and each chapter capturing a theme. Uh, so I would use political imagery, you know, uh, uh, history, uh, culture, food, uh, and then connect this to the city, and then take it from the city and connect it to a political theme. Accordingly, in, uh, I've used a number of chapters. For example, I've looked at uh, 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 Izmir, which is Turkey's third largest city. It's known to be a secu secular bastion. 
and I used the city's history as a depository of Turks and Muslims who came from the Balkans to discuss the I Turkish identity, but also take it from there to look at what I call the other Turkey, the Turkey that does not support the governing party and that stays staunchly secularist. Then I use other cities such as Gaziantep, which is on the border with Syria. I think if you have not heard of Gaziantep, you probably heard of it in the last year. Those of you who do work on Syria, so much going on. It's right across from Aleppo. This city is also famous for its baklava. Uh, you know, Turkish baklava is really good, so obviously. Um, and I use Gaziantep's you know, uh, food and cuisine. Uh, I spent some time there. It had inspired me, but also to make a case about what happens uh, successfully, what happens when you mix Islam and capitalism? Gaziantep, to me, epitomizes that. It shows that when Islam and capitalism mix, it does produce a cosmopolitan society. As in the case of the city, which has a world-class museum of Roman mosaics, which has universities that educate people from Italy and Papua New Guinea at the same time, and which has a quite an open downtown, vibrant life. And I also picked another city called Kayseri in central Turkey to make a case uh, to the opposite, that the mix of Islam and capitalism produces straitjacket social conservatism, hence the case of Kayseri, a city which also, like Gaziantep, has flourished in the last decade, but has not produced the same cosmopolitan and liberal and vibrant setting. And I think that's uh, Turkey's dilemma, that it has these kind of failing trends, that, which I'm going to go into in a minute, which I was able to bring to life in these various chapters. I have a chapter on uh, Malatya, uh, where I looked at the fall of the Turkish military. This is uh, the home of one of Turkey's four armies. I uh, looked at the, uh, the, the demise of the military in the last decade. I looked at, obviously, a chapter on Ankara, um, uh, which uh, I looked at uh, to, look, uh, to analyze and study the limits of Turkish soft power. Turkey's very ambitious foreign policy agenda to become a regional and global player and put this against the limitations of its uh, soft power. And I think uh, you'll be, uh, 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 especially those of you who have been to Ankara and Istanbul will find this exciting to read. But also, it gives, you a, it gives you a vantage point to look at Turkey's Syria policy and its challenges, which I'm happy to come to in the Q&A. I have a chapter on Bursa, which uh, th is where the Ottoman Empire was founded, which I look at, uh, which I used to look at Turkey's uh, never-ending problems with its non-Muslim minorities uh, to make a case that it is time for Turkey to grant constitutional recognition and first-class citizenship to non-Muslim minorities uh, because I think democracies are not about just protection of large minorities and majorities but also the protection of very small minorities and Turkey's Christians and Jews are tiny minorities but whether or not Turkey can grant them first-class citizenship, constitutional protection is in my view the test of Turkish democracy when it comes to that. Finally a chapter on Istanbul where I look at Turkey's uh, um, almost uh, devotion but also obsession with Ottomania the, uh, the rediscovery of the Ottomans, and of course the Turks have discovered the Ottomans in a rather benevolent way. They only remember the nice things about the Ottoman Empire. You have to ask the Greeks and Arabs and Serbs to find out that not everybody remembers the Ottomans fondly. I think that's something uh, Turkish leaders have found as they have decided to make Turkey, try to make Turkey a regional power in the Middle East, and found out that you know, not everybody loves the Turks the way Turks would like, think that they're loved. And Istanbul shows the limitations of that, but also makes a really good case that despite uh, the long way Turkey still has to go to rise, it has come a significant distance in the last decade, uh, primarily due to significant economic growth. Turkey has transformed in the last decade under the Governing Justice and Development Party, which has provided sound economic policies and good governance, which has made Turkey into a majority middle class society. I think Istanbul really makes a great case for that. So I know there are a lot of questions uh, when, you, when, when a book is titled The Rise of Turkey, especially given everything that's happening in the country now. Uh, the governing party and its allies in the Gulen movement are fighting. Uh, Turkey's Syria policy is increasingly exposing Turkey to risks coming from Syria. Its Middle East policy has left it without uh, allies. Turkey is the only country that has no ambassadors in Tel Aviv, Damascus and Cairo. You can get two, but three is hard. Uh, so challenges are, are huge, but despite that, I think I, I'm, I'm, uh, I remain optimistic about the country's future because economically it has been transformed. And I think once countries transform economically, become majority middle class societies, it's really hard for them to slide back. Uh, so I want to do a little reading actually to give you a sense of what this means uh, in terms of making a, a case for uh, Turkey's successful economic transformation. After that, I will come to its political challenges and foreign policy challenges. In, uh, this is from chapter one. In May 2013, millions of Turks poured onto the streets of Istanbul in the dead of night. 
Marching on the heart of the city, the massive procession shouted slogans, bang pots and pans, they really did, and dare the authorities to silence their defiant act of free speech. The city convulsed with protests for weeks. The spark that ignited the Gezi movement of June 2013 was public outrage at police treatment of a tiny group of environmentalists who were protesting the destruction of Istanbul's Gezi Park to make way for a shopping mall. Mainstream Istanbul may not have subscribed to the politics of these bohemian environmentalists, but they were prepared to passionately defend the rights of these individuals to free expression, even if it meant standing up to tear gas and water cannons. Two and a half million people did that over the course of a month. More than anything, this points to the rise of Turkey as a middle class society with democracy at its core. I think in the end Turkey will be fine just because of this. It will have challenges to go through, including foreign policy and domestic, but uh, in the long term I think the country is, is going to travel forward because of this economic transformation that has not only produced a middle class society with middle, very middle class demands, the demands of the Gezi Park protesters were not just about saving the park, they were about respect for freedom of expression, association, media, and assembly. And it was not your typical, quote unquote, elite Turks in Istanbul, it was the entire country that took up in rallies, two and a half million people participated, uh, showing that this, uh, the sense of middle class values is now pervasive across uh, the country. Obviously, this is a story that has deep roots in the transformation of Turkish society. Not only has it become majority middle class as of 2010, the first time this happens in any Muslim majority society. For those of you who are exploring Muslim majority societies, I think this is an incredible development because it is the Turkey's like the test case looking forward uh, as to what happens economically when Muslim societies transform into majority middle class. And what uh, I think is a protest is an uh, therefore unsurprising conclusion of that, that middle class demands do follow, uh, including the, uh, those demands that were enshrined in the Gezi movement. Something, another important development of the country in the last year, uh, the decade, is that it has also become uh, uh, increasingly more literate. Turkey's literacy rates are now at such a place that before the end of this decade, Turkey will become the first Muslim majority country in history to become universally literate. That's huge. When societies become universally literate, again, it's so difficult to rip them apart from the global society, and I think Turkey is about to reach that threshold. Literacy is over 93%. It is increasing by one percentage point every year. So you add to this 6, 7% by the end of the decade, it will be, in fact, by the end of the decade, it will be about universally literate. It has come at a time of phenomenal economic growth. Not only is Turkey more linked to the outside world, but also Turks feel much better because they have grown economically, leaps and bounds, doubling, tripling their income, while the world around them has melted down, both in the Middle East, with the Arab Spring and in Southern Europe with the Eurozone crisis. So I think if Turks felt good about their economic growth, this uh, relative sense of growth has actually made them overconfident. That's I think explains Turkey reaching out, punching about the weight because the world looks so good if you live in Istanbul, uh, especially if Turkey's traditional uh, rivals such as the Greeks and others are suffering through Eurozone crisis and Turkey's doing so well. The Arab countries are, are collapsing, imploding politically. Turkey is, despite its political battles, staying put. And I think that has given Turkey a sense of overconfidence, which explains, in my view, some of its outreach in foreign policy, but also the sense of overconfidence you get when you talk to Turks, like they know everything. They don't need to be told anything. And I think this is largely driven by economic growth. Another change in Turkey in the last decade is that it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful German word. It's, it's uh, Weltanschauung has changed. The way that Turks look at the world has uh, shifted. How so? It used to be that, again, if you've dealt with Turks, you would be able to relate to that. Turks kind of thought of themselves as Argentinians of the Middle East. Uh, with all due respect to Argentinians and Turks, I think, uh, the view of Argentinians is that they're accidentally placed in Latin America, they're really Europeans. The Turks thought that they're Europeans, they're accidentally placed next to the Middle East. This used to be the case in the, 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 the Turkey of the past of the Kemalist thinking, which was pervasive across the board. That is no more the case. To use a Latin American analogy, I think Turkey today is a country that thinks of, thinks of itself as the Brazil of the Middle East the dominant economic power whose opinion has to be consulted on every issue. It doesn't matter if they have the manpower and the skills, they know it. 
And I think that's going to stay. That's probably not going to change uh, whether or not the governing party stays in power. I think this new informed vision of the region, we are the Brazil of the region, is going to um, uh, uh, decide a lot of Turkish policies on the region. And I think partly uh, justfully so, uh, uh, justly so, because of this uh, tremendous economic growth. If you take out the energy sectors of the next two largest economies of the Middle East, Iran and Saudi Arabia, Turkey's economy is three, four times the size of the, the, the second uh, largest Middle East economy. That explains the sense of uh, overconfidence that they see in the region. Uh, but fascinatingly, I think, for the Turks is that because they're doing so well economically, our expectations from Turkey are higher than they were. And I think this is something they don't get. You know, when, whenever you, know, you, you, you make a statement or anybody else at the, at the government makes a statement about Turkey's democracy and its deficiencies, they get upset. But we're making those statements exactly because Turkey is doing so well economically and our expectations from Turkey are so high. And I think it's in Turkey's interest ultimately to do well on the, on the democracy front at, at home. Because in my view, Turkey is now at this interesting, what I call democratic launch window. There's something called the economic launch window. Turkey has passed that. It's no more a struggling country that has relies on IMF bailouts to grow. It's actually doing relatively well. But it does still have, it is still, I think, what it's considered in its democratic launch window. It is not a consolidated liberal democracy. It has significant problems at home from freedom of press to rule of law to the uh, separation of powers. And in my view, an argument I would make to the Turks is that only if Turkey becomes a truly liberal democracy can its creative classes decide that this is where they're going to stay and can it attract creative classes from outside of the country, therefore launching itself economically as well into an advanced economy and not just becoming a liberal democracy. I think it's in Turkey's interest to retain that. And Gezi protests show that in some ways that the people who demonstrated against the government during Gezi protests, it's incredible. I have a couple of former uh, assistants who had worked with me, a CEO who works at an energy company. You know, she tweeted me from one of the barricades. I said, what are you doing at the barricades? She said, I'm just fed up with this. I don't want the government to tell me how to live. And I think this, this is the same person who basically is going to decide whether she's going to stay in Turkey in the next five years or not. It's a great job. It works as CEO as an energy company, but maybe it doesn't see her future. And I think whether she can stay in Turkey will determine whether Turkey can become an advanced economy. And that hinges a lot on Turkey becoming a, a true liberal uh, democracy. The challenges there are for the government uh, and the opposition to realize that because of the unique way Turkish society has developed, Turkey has, I think, something that really goes well for its uh, future, which is that it has these large counter-failing blocks of social and political groups, none of which is uh, so large that it can simply wish the other one away. Let's call them, for the lack of a better words, conservatives and seculars, Islamists or secularists, liberals or, or those who support the AKP. And I think whichever way you want to frame it, you're going to find out that no one is going to take control of the entire country ever. Politically, that's not possible. Even after a decade of being in power, the governing party still gets 50%, maybe not even that. So that means it's the country split in the middle, and it will remain split in the middle. And I think the challenge of Turkey is for those who are in power and for those who are not in power to realize that the other side is not going to pack and leave. Not only they won't pack and leave, but they are numerically, economically, socially, and politically large enough that you will have to take them into account. So I think where Turkey is heading is not a future liberal paradise, unfortunately, though that's what I'd like to go see, but a, a libertarian society where you're going to have these very different visions of life, uh, mostly related to the role of religion in society and education and government, uh, ranging from the hard secularists to those who want to see no religion in government, and there are a lot of Turks who are like that, including those in Izmir, to those who are Islamists who basically want to see religion shape every aspect of society. They're the margins of the society. I think most Turks do not subscribe to either of these two strains. But to make a case that all these blocks will have to ultimately find a way to live together because one will not simply pack away and leave. And I think the future, therefore, is really a libertarian uh, society where the, uh, the new contract will be everyone lives uh, but also lets the other, others live. And I think that has been missing from the Turkish uh, uh, vernacular. 
uh, that depends on Turkey's new constitution. Uh, if I had money to bet, I would say that that's probably not going to be a libertarian document. Uh, but at the same time, I think the forces of society that you saw in Gezi protests will uh, move that, uh, the country in that direction. Uh, that uh, depends on the Kurds, uh, which is a big issue. I think ultimately it will come down to whether or not Turkey can grant them uh, uh, wide cultural rights, which is going to be Turkey's chance uh, to not only uh, resolve the Kurdish issue at home, but also to address uh, its Kurdish moment in the Middle East. As you know, Turkey now faces the prospects of uh, a weak and divided state in Syria next door. The Kurds there are increasingly taken over territory. Uh, the question is, can Turkey repeat with the Syrian Kurds what it has done with the Iraqi Kurds, build uh, great economic ties with the Iraqi Kurds and rapprochement, and that might just uh, happen. So let me just uh, quickly look at uh, the Kurdish issue and do another brief reading, again from my introductory uh, chapter. Indeed, by drafting a truly liberal libertarian charter, Turkey would be on its way to unlocking its potential in many areas. Not only would a new document provide space for the country's polarized ends to live together, but it would also allow Turkey to address its burning Kurdish problem. This is a challenge that has become even more pressing in recent years. The rise of Kurdish nationalism in Syria, Iraq, and Turkey sapped Turkey's energy. Ankara has to find a solution to its Kurdish problem if it is to emerge as a regional player free of domestic and regional violence that will consume the country's creative energy in foreign policy. As a fragile cease process is underway with the PKK Datis, Turkey can consolidate its progress by providing for broader cultural and individual rights to all citizens, including but not specific to the Kurds. I'll explain to you why I think these should be broad rights for everyone within the framework of the new constitution. This would be the most realistic remedy to Turkey's Kurdish problem. Such a formula within the new charter would likely satisfy both nationalist Kurds and also majority Turks who generally do not favor group-specific rights given to the Kurds, hence my point about broader individual rights. Uh, writing a book on Turkey is probably one of the most difficult challenges because, as you know, the country changes daily. So when I was writing these paragraphs, I was saying, I hope they're still relevant down a year. But I found out as a scholar of Turkey, I was born and raised in Turkey in Istanbul. I've made many trips back there since uh, you know, I, I settled here. Uh, that Turkey is like an onion, even for someone who's an expert of the country. You always think that you've gotten to the core, you take a peel away, and you're still never um, at the core. So the country is obviously full of surprises. But I think the Kurdish issue is one where uh, there will be progress uh, along the lines of what I've just read primarily because Turkey is realizing that this is its Kurdish moment in the Middle East, that uh, the Kurdish card that Turkey for so long thought was a challenge to it is now seen by the Turks as a benefit, as, a, as an asset that Turkey can use. I think that will drive Turkey's uh, Kurdish rapprochement uh, policy. Uh, it doesn't end here, though. I think Turkey's challenges beyond the Kurdish issue are multiple, and the biggest challenges are indeed in foreign policy. Uh, especially the country's uh, Syria policy, which has exposed the, sh the weaknesses or the shortage shortcomings of Turkey's foreign policy agenda. Turkey wanted to become a uh, Middle East player, uh, zero problems with all neighbors. The joke now is that they have problems with all neighbors, uh, zero neighbors, obviously. Uh, they have problems with Iran, Iraq, and Syria, problems uh, the Turkey's uh, traditional ties. Uh, with the European Union are, are strained, uh, but most importantly, Turkey has lost its ability to be uh, act as a soft power nation in the Middle East, which is that uh, it thought that it could get things done without using power, because it had economic uh, might, its uh, pro products dominated the stores, its TV shows dominated the airwaves, and there was a sense, if you looked at Turkey about five years ago, that Turkey was the rising soft power, it could get things done in the region. I think, to use uh, another country analogy, Turkey has found out that it's not quite there, and perhaps its uh, security situation in the Middle East looks like that of uh, Japan in East Asia. What I mean by that is the following. Japan is the dominant economic power of East Asia. Uh, it has a significant amount of soft power. Its products you know, are in demand from Singapore to South Korea. Yet at the end of the day, uh, Japan needs the U.S. as a security provider, having found out that it has regional challenges like the Chinese and the North Koreans. That, I think, is the discovery of the Turkish elites in the post-Arab Spring world, that they do need the United States and NATO, uh, as Japan does in East Asia, for long-term security, because soft power uh, does not bring them enough protection against regional instability, especially that 
uh, which comes from uh, Syria. And increasingly, uh, competition with Iran, I think, is driving the Turkish elites in the same direction. Uh, this is my conclusion. I don't think it's the conclusion of Prime Minister Erdogan yet. Uh, and you know, in the q and I'll be happy to look at whether or not we think he'll get there. But Turkey does indeed, I think, provide us with uh, room for uh, optimism in the sense that I think ultimately the leaders of the country will reach that point. Turkey's new leaders, uh, again from the introductory chapter, uh, page 12. Turkey's new leaders are victims of their own success. The cornerstone of Turkey's rise has been the government's ability to foster stable political conditions for economic growth. Such policies have helped the AKP win three successive elections with increased majorities. The electoral success, and you know there are elections coming up, two in the coming this year, uh, local nationwide in March, and presidential in the summer, and parliamentary in 2005. With this in, my, in, in the mind, the electoral success has been driven by phenomenal economic growth, which has in return made, had been made possible by Turkey's image as a stable and regionally responsible country, a reputation that has benefited Turkey by attracting record-breaking investment. Turkey grows because it attracts investment. It attracts investment because it's deemed stable, especially in a region where no other country uh, looks as stable as Turkey has been. I think that is the, uh, the Achilles heel of the AKP's uh, foreign policy. How adventurous they can be, how far away they can go from us, all depends on uh, whether or not they see this picture clearly. And I think it's, uh, it's, uh, we can't tell this to them enough times. They have to be reminded, and I think that's one of the themes of this book, to get the message out there. Accordingly, policies that could tarnish Turkey's reputation as a bastion of stability, such as failure to contain the fallout of the Syrian war, risk sapping the very essence of Turkish power, its comparative stability in an uncertain region. This realization has been, in my view, and will be the catalyst for Turkey's balancing of its uh, east and west. And I think this will uh, drive Turkish foreign policy as Turkey keeps coming to that conclusion that what makes Turkey successful is its uh, image as a stable nation, and this is what will help Erdogan win elections, if he is to win elections. I, I want to conclude by looking at Turkey, obviously, uh, the year ahead, uh, which I'm, I'll be happy to do in the Q&A, but I think this is a country uh, in which uh, uh, dramatic economic, tr economic transformation has resulted in a, a very changed view of the world, uh, given that Turkey is also a post-imperial society. Uh, people have found out that they were great once and they think they're great again. And because they're doing so well economically, nobody is telling them internally that they're not. And I think uh, adventurous foreign policy or over achieving foreign policy, therefore, has been a, 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 um, a, a theme that underlines Turkey's outreach. And I think Turkey has met some of its challenges. And I think their, their pivot uh, to the U.S. in the aftermath of the uh, Arab Spring, starting with Libya, continuing with Syria, uh, with the Chinese weapons deal hiccup still there, I think still explains that this is a country that cannot rip off its uh, strong ties to the, to the West. Uh, that ultimately, the rise of Turkey depends on the country's ability to balance uh, the yin and yang of Turkishness, uh, which is uh, its Islam and its, its Western connections. Why don't I stop here? Happy to take questions and comments, and thank you again, everybody, for coming. I also would love challenges, so <laughs> it will help me write the, my next book better, obviously. Well, let's uh, go straight to the elephant in the room, and what do you think about the corruption scandal and what, what impact it will have on, in terms of the presidential elections this year? Uh, uh, it's not something that I covered in the book, uh, because it's current, but it is something that I look at in the book, uh, the Gulen movement. Um, uh, there, there's a chapter which discusses its role in Turkish society. Uh, what, I am traveling to Gaziantep. Uh, I did travel to some of the cities uh, before I wrote the book and as, as I wrote the book, and some of them I just used artistic license. Uh, I was. Uh, raised in Turkey and I, I uh, put myself through graduate school at Yale uh, by being a tour guide and I traveled to all Turkish provinces so I can kind of write that I thought uh, that I was there and looking around and so in Gaziantep I'm walking around and I'm seeing this old city which once which is a, a, a ghost of itself it, in the 19th century this was a very cosmopolitan place it had a large community of Armenians, uh, Arabic-speaking Jews, uh, Muslim Turks who lived together. Uh, now, obviously, uh, the Jewish and Armenian communities are not there anymore. 
Uh, the Armenian community was deported during World War One. The Jewish community left in the 70s uh, because when Turkey's uh, had its worst economic crisis uh, in modern history, uh, and Gaziantep then went into a decay. Uh, for many years, it was considered a backwater, and if you go there now, you'll be shocked. Uh, you know, you have uh, direct flights to Germany, uh, three a day. Uh, you have uh, a university, as I said, that educates students from Papua New Guinea. The, the part that shocked me most about Gaziantep was I went, as I went there, I had, you know, uh, dinner, really good food, by the way, even by Turkish standards. Uh, so I'm having these wonderful uh, meals, and I met uh, a businessman. I said, what do you do? He said, I sell pasta to Italians. It's like, wow. <laughs> okay, if they're selling pasta to Italians, they're doing something right. And uh, that was a Gulenis business guy, and uh, talked about his contacts uh, with the government, and uh, gave you a sense that uh, the Gulen movement, back then, this is about a year ago, uh, supported the governing party AKP, but was never part of the coalition, part of the party itself, but rather part of a coalition. I think the splits are, are um, have multiple. The split has multiple facets to it. I think we can call it a split now, because it's it's official. A lot of uh, Gulenist columnists are writing in pro-Gulen papers saying that this is a split. They're not going back to the AKP's fault. Uh, it's not to suggest that the governing AKP, which has about half of the electoral support, maybe less than just under half, it's not to say that it's breaking into many pieces or it's splitting in the middle. I think in terms of electoral support, the Gulenists are probably maybe one, two, three percent, uh, maybe a little bit higher, but they're definitely not, you know, half or a significant part of this 45 percent uh, that is likely to vote for the AKP. But uh, they're appealing away as uh, significant because they have huge influence in the media. Uh, and they also had uh, many of their supporters in the bureaucracy, including in the judiciary and the courts. And they have a, a widespread appeal outside of Turkey, much more masterful and, and uh, PR-wise crafty than the political machinery of the AKP. So I think what it will do is uh, domestically it will be a challenge to them. Uh, and the split, I don't think it's just political. I think uh, uh, I have seen, uh, obviously this is still in court, so we're, we're, we are to see what comes out of court proceedings, but I've, I've wiretaps which have been obtained illegally in Turkey for about a decade now, first in the Ergenekon case where the Gulenists and the AKP went against the military and now in the, uh, where they're being used mutually by the Gulenists against the government and by the government against the Gulenists, wiretaps are suggesting that corruption allegations are probably uh, uh, not uh, uh, without valid concern. Uh, you know, I've, I've listened to one where, where a minister says, oh, this suitcase is so heavy, uh, full of money, I hope it doesn't burst before I take it upstairs. And he has money counting machines upstairs. Um, so there's a lot of, I think, these allegations which we're going to hear, uh, which, and I don't think we've seen the end of it. What it will really do is, uh, ultimately, it will depend on what happens in the local elections of March 30th. Uh, local elections do not change government in Turkey. Uh, so if the AKP loses, Erdogan is still in charge, but uh, they could change the nature of his power in Turkish politics, uh, and especially depending on what happens in the large cities, inclu including Turkey's largest city, Istanbul. Uh, the gap between AKP and the opposition Republican People's Party, which is a secularist opposition, is uh, in double digits. That gap is not going to be closed in a matter of two months, regardless of how significant these corruption allegations are. Uh, it may drop a little bit, but I, uh, I think we can uh, uh, f uh, uh, project that uh, the AKP is going to be the winner of the forthcoming local elections, nationwide uh, the numbers taken into account. The question is not whether they'll win the national, national elections, it's whether they'll hold on to Istanbul. That's going to be a close race. Uh, it has always been a competitive race, and it will be a competitive race as of the last elections. In Istanbul, the AKP did 44, the CHP did 37. The gap is only single digits, 7 percent points. Uh, the CHP is running a very popular candidate, which will help them close some of the gap. He will also face corruption allegations. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, an, the, the, uh, if, I think that the, uh, the leitmotiv of Turkish politics right now is anyone who's rising faces these allegations. The question is not if they're corrupt, it's how successfully they can navigate the allegations uh, and how good politicians they are. So this uh, opposition uh, candidate might help the CHP close the gap. Uh, even then, I think it's a, still going to be a tough race. It will then become an issue of whether or not the Gulenist peeling away from the uh, AKP will actually undermine their electoral success in Istanbul. If they can do that, if they can prove that because of their swing away from AKP and they're not voting for the AKP, 
the Gulenists. It's not to say they'll vote for the CHP. I think it's hard for me to imagine that they would vote in mass for a liberal secularist candidate, but they will not vote for the governing party. But if they can demonstrate that it's because of their sw swing away from the AKP, the governing party has lost the elections, that will provide them as a kingmaker of Turkish politics. If at the same time, though, despite their uh, swing away from the AKP, the Erdogan still keeps Istanbul, uh, he will have subjugated the Gulen movement, I think. Uh, effectively, uh, what happens at the end of the elections is going to be crucial. Uh, Erdogan's rise to national dominance and international recognition started. Uh, now go back to your you know, mental Googles. When did you first hear of Erdogan? 1994, when he became Istanbul's mayor. Uh, he, he started his political career as a national, then international politician when he became Istanbul's mayor because, you know, you control Turkey's largest city. That's psychologically significant. It's also economically significant. You control all this money that's made in these high-rises. That's about a third of the Turkish economy. The economy of Turkey is almost $1.4 trillion. So this will be large enough that you could fit Austria in it and you could still throw in a couple of wealthy European countries. So if you control all this money, uh, this is the future of Turkish politics. Uh, Erdogan's rise started in Istanbul. If CHP takes Istanbul from Erdogan, it will be uh, considered the, the beginning of the rise of CHP. But if it loses Istanbul, it will be the beginning of the end of the Gulen movement. And at the same time, Erdogan will have proven that he is the new dominant power of uh, Turkish politics. So I think that's the race to watch for all of us to see what happens. If I had money to bet, I would say that it's still going to be a very close race. Uh, if I had $100,000, I would put 80000 on AKP winning the election still because of the fact that uh, Erdogan had, did not take all his rabbits out of the hat yet. He's got a lot of surprises waiting. Uh, Erdogan wins primarily because he delivers good governance and growth. You know, the Achilles heel of Turkey's foreign policy is image of a stable country because growth is what keeps him getting elected. So he cannot be adventurous. He cannot rip off the Band-Aid with us and walk away. Even if he wanted to, I don't think he could. Uh, he doesn't want to lose that image of a stable country with a strong ally. Domestically, also, he has done well economically by providing growth, but also good governance. And by good governance, I mean really good governance, such as high-speed rail and subway lines. Uh, Istanbul has benefited from some of these investments. Uh, um, one has come online. Uh, it's a rail connection which goes from Istanbul's uh, Anatolian side. Uh, Turks don't call the Anatolian side Asian side, by the way. When you tell them this is Asia, they're like, that's not Asia. Uh, but so you know. Um, <laughs> from Istanbul's Anatolian side to its European side, it used to be that you would drive across the bridges, uh, commute that would take an hour in no traffic. Uh, the tunnel now helps you make that trip in four minutes. If you lived in Istanbul, would you vote for Erdogan? If he made that trip to uh, cut that commute for you from an hour in no traffic to two hours in traffic to four minutes, of course. And I think that's what's going to help him, uh, despite the corruption allegations and other issues that might come up. And not everything has come out yet uh, in terms of uh, good governance uh, delivery of that. High-speed rail train is going to kick in. Uh, of course, Turkish style, it will kick in first and then it will run successfully. But doesn't matter, it will kick in before the elections. Uh, it will cut down commuting from downtown Istanbul to downtown Ankara to under three hours. Again, it will change the way people live. So people in Istanbul will no more be stuck in Ankara when they go there. They can now go back to Istanbul at the end of the day. <laughs> Those of you who have served in Ankara and Istanbul, I think, can really. Sorry, Ankara. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hello, how are you? Good, Good to see you. Oh, to thank see you. you. Thank you. Tell me about your views on the military. Are they just totally <laughs> emasculated? Are they ever going to be able to protect secularity? And what will happen with all the generals and retirees and so on who are, you know, under house arrest, still awaiting process yeah. and all that? Uh, the, the short story of the military is in my book, uh, in, the, in the Malatya chapter. Um, it's a fascinating read. Uh, by the way, if, you, uh, um, um, if, you're, uh, if you're interested in getting the book, you can go to our website at the Institute and, and go to a link, or you can just find it on Amazon. I'll be uh, happy to discuss it further. Uh, um, I, I'll be happy to send you my per contact information through Hugh later on if you have follow-up questions. But to go to your specific question on the military, 
Uh, we have seen the rise of the military in the last uh, decade, uh, but also its fall in the sense that it's, it thought that it was the most powerful institution in the country, and then we found out that it's not. And I think the military's power uh, dissolved, I would say dissolved is a good word, because it did not use the power that people thought that it did at a time when it should have, if it wanted to keep its power, and that was in 2003, the Iraq War decision. Uh, when Turkey was voting whether or not to participate in the Iraq War, the military, which everyone thought was the kingmaker in Ankara, called all the shots, stayed out of it. Remember? And they did it to embarrass the AKP because the idea was let the AKP decide for the war. Uh, if it's a you know, failure, they'll, they'll suffer from it and the military was not going to be blamed. It was the first time the military did not uh, make a call on a major foreign policy issue. Uh, and the AKP did. And Turks realized that, you know what, hell doesn't freeze over. When the military doesn't call a shot, things get work. And it, Turkey's Iraq policy actually worked because it did not enter the war, but then it worked with us. So it got the after we you know patched up the relationship, things became rosy again with the U.S. And I think it did not suffer from the fallout of not cooperating with the U.S. And that was the beginning. Uh, the second time I think the military played its hand wrong was when it issued an e memorandum against the AKP when it wanted to run its own candidate for presidency, President Gül who back then was an AKP member, who has since become the Turkish president. Uh, it's fascinating. The military issued an a memorandum, put a declaration on its website, and said, we absolutely object to this person's candidacy. The next day he said, I'm a candidate. What are you going to do? That was the end of it. People realized that it is not a powerful institution because it, its threats are empty, and it does not exercise power when it should. And I think that was the end of it. The Ergenekon Khan case, which ended up jailing a huge number of Turkish officers, obviously broke, broke the back of the military. The question is, will it come back? Uh, not in the way that it once ran Turkish politics. I think that's gone. I think Turkey's experience uh, with Kemalism as a top-down modernizing project is over. Kemalism is not over, though, because there are Kemalists in Turkey, very large groups. There's, uh, there are people who are... Uh, shaped by Kemalism for many uh, uh, generations going back. So I think we are seeing uh, the rise of a post-Kemalist Turkey, but in this Turkey there will be Kemalists, and many of them, not just a few, but so large numbers that the governing party will have to accommodate them. The CHP is largely a Kemalist party, although it has a liberal wing as, as well. I would say many who vote for it are def, uh, staunch Kemalists, and it does receive 30, 25 to 30 percent support, so that's a very large uh, contingency. So I can't see the military ever making a comeback, but I think uh, uh, it will, uh, a lot will also depend, the future of the Ergenekon case I think depends on what happens now, because uh, uh, Erdogan is trying to find as many allies as he can get against the military domestically. And so although once upon a time he stood behind the Ergenekon case, which ended up putting so many of the generals behind jail, now he's actually reaching out to the military saying, well, maybe you have the right to retrial because some of these trials were not fair. You know, there was not due process. Uh, I have two explanations for this. One is Erdogan is trying to win the military as an ally against uh, the Gulenists, uh, hoping that retrial will allow some of the generals to go free. And none of these trials were, in, you know, uh, if you look at the trials from the purely technical perspective, there were a lot of problems in the way they were carried out. Um, that's why I, I, I am more inclined to go with my second conclusion. I think it's also the Turkish judges who are saying, you know what, these generals that we locked up are going to take their cases to the European Court of Human Rights, which is going to overturn our decisions, and that's going to embarrass us. We don't want to look like Russia, or worse. So they're actually covering their back, realizing that the Europe, it's a matter of a year, months, before the European courts take up these cases and embarrass Turkey, and they will. They will tell Turkey, you locked A and B and C up unfairly, their case has to be retried, and I think that's one way of Turkish uh, judges getting out of this, this hole they're in, uh, which is why I love Turkey's European Union accession process. Uh, I think it is, after, despite the economic rise of the country, it's still meaningful for Turkey and for the Europeans. Uh, it's meaningful for Turkey because although Turkey does not need Europe economically anymore, it still needs it politically. I think Europe's soft power for political transformation in Turkey is still huge. Uh, I know this because every time the EU issues a report, uh, those of you who are Euro uh, Europeans, uh, this is a, a great tool for us to use. Uh, I'll be, uh, every time the EU issues a report on Turkey's accession and criticizes Turkey, the Turks get upset. I like that. It means they take the EU seriously. I'll be, I'll be worried when the EU issues a report 
criticizes Turkey and Erdogan says, who cares? Because then you've, you could argue that EU has lost its soft power over Turkey and I think it's still there and it's still a catalyst for democratic uh, liberalization and the rise of a liberal libertarian society. I think Europeans obviously need Turkey, you can't tell it enough many times, but I have to just tell you this one joke. I briefed a, a European uh, uh, diplomat last week and you know, as I was walking out of my office, I, we discussed Turkey and Syria, nobody wants to discuss Turkey and EU, so, and Turkey's domestic issues. I wanted to ask him, I said, what do you think of Turkey's EU accession? And he was one of these skeptical guys. And like, I said, I think Turkey is going to enter the EU during Kosovo presidency, what do you think? <laughs> he did not say no. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Do you think Turkey's high energy deficit is going to limit its ability to exert soft power in the region? Or do you see it as an opportunity for reproachment with uh, states such as Israel and Cyprus uh, to exploit the light natural gas the natural gas reserves, just as it did with uh, oil with the uh, KRG? I, I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, Turkey's energy deficiency. Turkey is uh, off the uh, uh, all G20 members, uh, and I think that's an important benchmark for Turkey. Turks love the fact that they're in G20. I, I often think, a little digression, I often think about how Erdogan thinks when he goes to G20. He shows up at these summits, all these other leaders come and go, he's always there. I think that's his sense of accomplishment that he keeps getting elected and he has he has worked with the predecessor of every G20 leader and he's the only one who's a constant fixture since that group was created and I, you know if you want to get a sense of how he feels towards other leaders but also how he feels about his democratic record he's very confident as a result of that and uh, you know I think uh, some of the confidence has turned into overconfidence in terms of dismissing checks and balances but nevertheless he he does thrive I think anytime he's invited to a G20 summit uh, and I think he thrives in general when he is uh, allowed to have face time with uh, leaders of great powers, including uh, our president. At the same time, though, I think uh, Turkey's G20 membership is, uh, puts Turkey in a unique category among all G20 members. Uh, with the exception of uh, South Korea and Japan, Turkey is the only G20 member that has neither nuclear nor its own uh, uh, significant energy deposits. So it's very dependent on energy imports. It's, it's rare in this case among many G20 members that it has to import energy for, to continue growing and it is not only importing huge amounts of energy, Turkey has almost no oil and no gas, but it's, uh, it's, it's building nuclear, but I'll see it when I, you know, when it happens, I'll believe it when it happens. Uh, it's uh, uh, deficient in the sense of its economic uh, dependency on energy imports. And not only that, but it imports uh, uh, well, I can. No, I won't tell you this. I'll ask you a question. Um, I was going to tell you which, from which countries Turkey imports most of its gas and oil. Instead, I'm going to ask you the following question: To which uh, foreign heads of state Erdogan never yells? <laughs> Russia and Iran. <laughs> you will see him get crazy with everybody. You know, lose his temper. Uh, his mercurial, obviously, uh, in public, uh, behind closed doors. Never with the Russians and Iranians. At least one reason is the energy dependency. Uh, and the sense that Turkey gets uh, three quarters of its natural gas and oil imports from these two countries. And if it pisses the Iranians and the Russians off, Turks will freeze in the, freeze in the winter. And Turkey gets really cold in the winter. Not only that, but it, it, pr it uh, produces about half of its electricity on natural gas. So it's very dependent. So it is uh, dying to diversify from Iranian and Russian gas. So Erdogan can yell at them. No, I'm joking, no. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's really trying hard to diversify. They have done two things to diversify. One is, despite uh, you know, some of our policies, they've gone forward with the Iraqi Kurds to get gas and oil from the Iraqi Kurds, and they will do that, because this is as much building ties with the Kurds, uh, creating a Kurdish cordon sanitaire, so it's a buffer between uh, instable Iraq and Syria and Turkey, uh, uh, creating uh, a leverage into the tur uh, addressing Turkey's own Kurdish problem, as it is a tool aimed at diversifying Turkey's energy dependency on Iran and Russia, the projects with the Iraqi Kurds. Along the same lines, I think this is why I remain optimistic about tur Turkish-Israeli normalization. Uh, I've recently heard that we're at the cusp of a deal, we might be there. I think it will not happen before the elections in Turkey, it will happen after the elections, uh, if normalization was to become public. Erdogan has nothing to gain from it before the elections. Believe it or not, Erdogan has his own political right that will target him 
if he normalizes with the Israelis because they're going to say, well, yesterday you criticized them, today you're doing dinners with them. And I think he doesn't want to do that before the elections, but he does want to normalize. And not because he likes Israel or he, he sees the value of Turkish-Israeli strategic relations in the region, but primarily because he has to and, and he wants to diversify away from Russian and Iranian gas. And the Israeli gas fines are in this regard a, a huge opportunity for Turkey. And I think his diplomats are also telling him that this is in Turkey's interest. It's a new game, the big game in the Eastern Med, and Turkey should not miss out on it. So I think we will see Turkey normalizing uh, with the Israelis. Uh, and it will also come down to, I think, cooperation on Syria. Once normalization takes place, uh, Turkey is going to realize that uh, Turkey and Israel share, uh, even though they don't like each other the way they used to, they share similar threat perceptions emanating from Syria. What are they? Number one, an Assad-controlled rump state or a rump state controlled by Assad supporters. Number two, Al-Qaeda enclaves. Both are huge threats for both countries in the same order. And I think it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, following normalization I and mean, before normalization, they would already be uh, talking about what to do in Syria uh, for contingency planning. Yes, question in the back, please. I think you need to wait for a mic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your very succinct and interesting overview of your book. Appreciate it. I work in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, so my focus is on the Syrian refugees in in Turkey. And Turkey has been very reluctant to work closely with the UN organizations and NGOs who typically come in and do um, uh, assistance work with uh, refugees. Uh, can you speak to that issue, why you think that is? Thank you. It, it, there's a wonderful Greek word, it's called xenophobia. Um, <laughs> it does describe a lot of Turks and Greeks shared challenges. Uh, I think there's a general distrust of uh, foreigners. It, it's really hard for someone to show up and say, I work for an NGO, they will never believe you. Uh, you always have to have an agenda that, that's not visible. Uh, and, that, and I think that's one reason why they don't like NGOs working out there in general. They never trust them. And I think part of this is, uh, to, give, to be fair to Greeks and Turks, is rooted in their, um, their history of 19th century great power games when they were, in fact, subjected to great power manipulation by the French, uh, the Russians, and the British as they were carving up the Ottoman Empire. So I think they, elites and people alike, I think they suffer from that legacy of not trusting foreigners and foreign institutions, always thinking that they have agendas. And I think this, despite this phenomenal economic growth story, which should make Turks feel very confident, comfortable, at ease with themselves, you know, they're growing when nobody else is, they have become a G20 nation, they are at every summit, Turkey still thinks that uh, foreigners are trying to divide Turkey. It's, it's this, uh, this, this uh, what's called the Serv Syndrome, Serv is the treaty that uh, basically discombobulated the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I, it never went into effect, but I think it does summarize the, the mindset. So that, I think, is your, your primary challenge. And the second, I think, is uh, Turkey's Syria policy is multifaceted in the sense that it's, it does allow weapons uh, to cross the radicals. It does allow radicals to cross in. So I think they'd like to keep others out as much as they can because they're also not sure about exactly what they're doing uh, and, and what the implications of that would be. Uh, that's my second explanation. And, and third, I think, uh, Turkey's refugee policy on Syria. We did a study at the Institute recently on this. I'll be happy to send you a copy. It's called The Impact of uh, Syrian Refugees in Southern Turkey, where it really looks at uh, the Syrian refugee issue in Turkey not as a, an issue that impacts the whole country, because it doesn't. Turkey is so big uh, and demographically and geographically so large that even a million plus Syrians is a drop in the ocean in Turkey, whereas it is, you know, 20 percent or 30 percent of Jordan's population. In Turkey, that's uh, barely over 1 percent. So it has so far managed with this issue well, but it has generally contained it to southern Turkey, where the refugees are settled, where the impact of refugees is significant in the sense that they are altering the ethnic and demographic makeup of some of those provinces. Uh, Hatay, the southernmost province, uh, is on the cusp, in my view, if it has not already become uh, Turkey's first Arab majority province because of the inflowing uh, of refugees. And these people are not going back anytime soon. And I think um, uh, this is a scary time for uh, Erdogan, uh, not knowing where uh, the refugee issue will go. Uh, if you have over a million Syrians in Turkey, you, that means you also have people go, go and come come and go back and forth. 
Uh, they don't really know who comes in back and forth. I think it exposes Turkey to risks and threats. As I said, uh, that's Erdogan's Achilles heel. The last thing he wants is the image of an unstable country. And I think Syria is Turkey's uh, uh, almost open border. It really is. That it can no more uh, monitor who goes back and forth. And I think they really are scared, in my view. Uh, it brings me to a conclusion. I think uh, not, this may not be the conventional wisdom in town yet, but I think we'll get there eventually. I think in Syria, uh, Turkey needs us perhaps more than we need Turkey because of this very open nature and unpredictable nature of the threats that are coming from Syria. The fact that they have this open border policy for refugees, uh, which was humanitarian and political, has uh, basically uh, facilitated the importation of the Syrian problem into Turkey and the war. So, you know, whatever groups are on the other side of the border, they're also on the Turkish side. And I think uh, that you may not be getting this, such a clear reading in your meetings with your Turkish counterparts. I think that is going to be the view in Ankara in the coming year. As uh, if, unless we have a magic political solution, uh, Syria continues further and uh, descending into becoming what if a, a weak or divided state on Turkey's borders. The last thing Erdogan wants, Erdogan who wants to become president, possibly, if not, uh, have someone from his party become the next president and take government again in 2015. The last thing he wants is a Somalia-style failed state next door. What does that do to Turkey's image of a stable country? Turkey grows because it attracts huge amounts of foreign direct investment that is basically a portfolio investment that goes into the Istanbul stock market, over $40 billion a year, which drives its economic growth. And that money is very jittery. It's money that could leave Turkey tomorrow if it thinks that Turkey is bordering Somalia. I think that's why he's got to, he's got to do anything he can to maintain, uh, contain the Syria crisis in Syria, but also he'd be, you could make an argument that we can help you do that. Uh, if you can pass through that you know, uh, mindset or uh, the, the, uh, the mind wall of the uh, xenophobia that comes before that, I think. I think we have a couple more minutes. I can do a couple more questions or finish up. Yes, yeah. yes, sir. Is there a mic in the back? Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, my question relates to emerging leadership in Turkey. Do you have any viewpoints on uh, the ability of the various political parties in Turkey to groom a new uh, generation of political leadership? Uh, for instance, this summer we saw during the Gezi Park protests, lots of people coming out uh, around very specific causes, yet no real leadership emerged from that. So that would be a continuation of the perennial problem uh, with the opposition. But then even with the um, uh, ruling party, uh, there aren't many signs that there is a new generation of leadership really being groomed. I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. Uh, uh, great question. Thanks, and Good to see you. Um, uh, probably not. Uh, in the, in the near future, I think with the exception of uh, Mustafa Sarigil, who's running to become Istanbul's mayor. Um, I know nothing is off the record, but off, off the record. I think uh, Sarigil is, is sort of a secular Erdogan. He, he can do for the electorate what Erdogan can do. He, he can walk and talk like he's the guy from the other side of the tracks. If he can survive the corruption allegations and, and uh, the political uh, battle that's coming up, uh, Erdogan's success in reaching out the electorate is twofold. His party has delivered economic growth and good governance. But why does he keep getting elected? Why is he so popular? What well, the Turks, I think, lies in the fact that he is, uh, he's just a really, really good politician. I, I tend to think that politics is, 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 is like an art. In, in other words, you can be born with a talent to it, or your parents can send you to take classes at it. Erdogan has done both. He's born with a talent at, in politics, and he also was sent to classes, which is that he has been in politics since the 70s. He broke his tooth in politics in the welfare party, uh, in which he rose to become Istanbul's mayor, and then take over the country. He's rare in this case, as I, you know, I was mentioning his uh, appearances at G20 summits. He not only wins elections, he wins them with increased majorities. That's, that's really hard for incumbents, and he's done it three times so far. I think his success uh, is driven by the fact that he's incredibly charismatic, very successful. Uh, when he talks, uh, no one thinks that he could be a millionaire or a billionaire or someone who's, who lives in a nice house on the Bosphorus. He talks and walks and breathes like someone from the other side of the tracks, and he's incredibly appealing. And that's something that's missing from most 
uh, other leaders in the political elite, with the exception of uh, Sergei, who I think has a similar appeal uh, in terms of his uh, charisma. If he survives, uh, if he takes Istanbul as mayorship, for example, it's very likely that he will take over CHP's leadership. But if it, even if not, I think if he does relatively well in Istanbul compared to the last time uh, the CHP did, he will still be considered a rising uh, figure. Uh, Erdogan's centrality to AKP, I think, cannot be underestimated. Having said this, he's a very uh, powerful figure over the party. And this is his challenge as Turkey prepares for presidential elections. So uh, the current con the constitution says that the president has to be a nonpartisan figure. Obviously, Turkey is a parliamentary democracy. Uh, so the president is a figurehead. Uh, the prime minister is the chief executive. That's what Erdogan is. So technically, yeah, and, and rationally speaking, he should not want to become president. Why does he want to become president? Because that's what Ataturk was. I think in every Turk, there's a little Ataturk. Uh, <laughs> even, in, even in Erdogan, he's, he wants to get there, what Ataturk was, and he wants to get there through popular vote. Be uh, previously, presidents were elected through the parliament as per recent amendments to the constitution. This will be the first time the president will be elected through a popular vote. So Erdogan, who has you know, moved Turkey into a post-Kemalist phase, wants to get to Ataturk's place and do so through popular vote. Now, it's, this was a trip in his head for you. Uh, and he wants to get there, and I think he's really uh, trying hard. Uh, but he also knows that if he gets there with, while eliminating his affiliation to the party, what happens to the AKP then? Uh, past experience shows that uh, large uh, governing parties like AKP in Turkey, such as the Motherland Party and the True Path Party in the 90s, which were uh, respectively ruled by Turgut Azal in the 80s and Demirel in the 90s, imploded soon as the charismatic and dominant leader left that party. And that could be the AKP's fate as well. So I think it's a great question because if there is no Erdogan to follow Erdogan in AKP, if he becomes president, that's the siren call of Turkish politics. He, he won't resist the temptation. He will go for what Ataturk went, as everybody else has done. But if he leaves the party, in the absence of another charismatic dominant leader, such as he, uh, him running the party, it's very likely that the AKP could also implode uh, in uh, maybe under two election cycles, as did the Motherland Party and the True Path Party. Both of those parties imploded in less than 10 years when Azal and Demirel left their party positions respectively to become president. Uh, both went from 40% to under 5% support in less than 10 years. So I think his game plan is to uh, become president but retain his party affiliation, but that requires him to pass an amendment to the constitution, which is very tricky. Uh, and that's what makes Turkey so fascinating for those of us who study the country. There's never a dull moment. Great. Uh, Dr. Yes, uh, Dr. Chaptai, thank you again so much for all this wonderful analysis. Um, uh, one of the, the issues maybe you haven't so directly spoken to, but maybe there's proxies for it in talking about Kamalists, is the internal dynamic between, I would say, more Erdogan than necessarily Ak, but also with, um, with the Alev population and uh, with the subset that's politically active. How is that dynamic now stacking up and where do you see it playing out over the next year or two through the, the local elections, the national elections, the constitution's formation? The, uh, the Alevis are uh, um, a community of Muslims in Turkey who constitute anywhere from, according to State Department's own estimates, anywhere from 12 to 25 percent of the population. Uh, figures are hard because Turkey does not ask for ethnic uh, uh, origins or religion in its census data, uh, like most European countries. So any figures on the number of Kurds, number of Alevis and others in Turkey is usually a good estimate. So that's why I think the estimate of Alevis ranges anywhere from 12 to 25 percent. Um, those of you who are not familiar with uh, Turkey or the Alevis, uh, I think the best way to describe them is that they're not Sunnis. Sunnis are Turkey's majority, uh, obviously, and the Alevis uh, are, I, I, I call them Unitarian Universalist Muslims. If there was this kind of an understanding of Islam, um, does it make sense? Okay, I don't know if to, that saves us time. So uh, that puts them in, in, uh, in many ways in, uh, uh, in, a, in a position politically where they do not support the governing party, which they think is too conservative, too rigid in its interpretation of Islam, and too uh, monolithic. Um, just uh, suffice it to say that although the AKP has reached out and uh, gathered allies from all segments of the society, 
especially in the last decade. Uh, some of these allies have since left the party. The liberals, the Gulenists have abandoned it. Although the party reached out and gathered allies from all segments of the society, never was able to break into the Alevi community. Uh, there were never Alevis who were in, in uh, prominent positions in the party. There were one or two Alevi deputies who were elected on AKP ticket. That's uh, one or two out of 350. Less than 1%, if, even if they're constituting over 10% of the population, so minimal representation. And they have to usually abandon the party after joining it, realizing that uh, or saying that the party is not uh, faithful to their promises to the Alevis and is not sincere in reaching out. All this would have been a uh, nice historical conversation if this war in Syria had not happened. We would have left the room and saying, well, like, AKP and Alevis don't get along, but so what? The Alevis are 15% and AKP gets half of the support. Uh, the Syrian war has uh, the potential to mobilize the Alevi community uh, in certain ways. And I think that's another fear uh, that's real for Turkey to address. And in the sense that uh, the, the Alevis in Turkey see Erdogan's policy in Syria as sectarian, uh, helping a Sunni rebellion. And, uh, you know, they have traditionally, the Alevis have traditionally shared hostility and suspicion of Sunni uh, Islamic activism. So they see this as another episode of Islamic activism, which especially targets another com community, in their view, in Syria, which is the Alawites. Uh, the Alawites in uh, Syria and the Alevis in Turkey are not the same. Uh, uh, they w just as all Protestants are not protesters, their names sound similar. Uh, they both like Ali, that's why they have eponymous, similar, ep almost eponymous names, but they're very different communities. But they both are uh, heterodox uh, Islamic communities and they both share deep suspicions of Sunni Islam. So politically they're aligned. Religiously, theologically they're not. Historically they're very different. The Alawites speak Arabic, they live in Syria, th though there's a smaller Alawite community in Hatay province, which makes it more like Syria than Turkey in terms of the uh, sectarian issue. The Alevis speak Turkish or sometimes Kurdish uh, or in, in the Balkans, uh, Albanian and other uh, languages. And they're distinctly Turkish in their interpretation of Islam uh, in the sense that they're the, uh, one of the few Muslim communities around the world that actually pray in Turkish not, and not in Arabic. You know, all Muslims uh, carry prayers in Arabic. So they're very Turkish in their understanding of Islam and I think that sets them apart. But they have aligned politically with the Alawite community because they both oppose the AKP's Syria policy famously. Uh, the Gezi protests, for example, which started as liberal demonstrations, uh, 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 lasted for about six weeks in May and June. Then there was a huge crackdown, as you remember. Then there were uh, new attempts to revive the Gezi protests during the summer and since. It's uh, almost uh, without fail that every time there is a new post-Gezi protest, that protest is led by Alevis or Alawites. So they have mobilized uh, as a result of the protest. I wouldn't say that Gezi was an Alevi affair. I think they have, Gezi has helped them uh, rally and mobilize and they found out that they can have allies. So you could see them demonstrating against the government's Syria policy if they see that that's become even more interventionist in favor of Sunni Islamic activism as they see it. I think that will shape uh, some of Turkey's foreign policy considerations. Uh, but suffice it to say that I don't think the Alevis will reach out to AKP to vote for it and uh, they'll probably be uh, staying in the uh, opposition CHP's camp. That was a great talk. Thank you all for staying, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody.